Sometimes I stare at the texture of the bricks in the little wall beside the ridge. I look at the fish in Lilithorn Brook. So familiar I could give them names. I study the rain that collects in the barrel behind the stable. I try to see the change in any of it since this madness came over the world. Somewhere, something in the earth must show the signs of where it came from. But it is as if the earth could not be bothered to leave one word of testament as we are murdered and our blood slips away. On the seventeenth night of the Year of the Yellow Horse, a wearied young woman stumbled out of Novembra Pass west of the Valmy Mountains and toward the tiny light she saw in the window of a dark cabin. The weather was freezing and wet. Six inches of snow had fallen since midday. The woman was on the verge of starvation and suffering the effects of a rat bite on her left ankle. For a time as she struggled along, limping badly, feverish, she hallucinated that the light was coming from the heavens above her. Only when she felt the arm of another human being, the first she had encountered in two weeks of desperate foot travel, did she understand that she was temporarily safe. She knew herself only by her first name, Han. She was 19 years old. Her savior was an enfeebled old man named Cedro Vanton. He'd barely been able to lift his bulk from his chair in the remote cabin that was not his own. But he had sensed someone out there in the awful night and summoned the strength to rise. He shared what little bread he had with Hanth, gave her tea, and rewrapped her frozen fingers. When she had recovered her senses, she told him she had been a novitiate at the Green Convent, ninety miles away. Vanton himself had been Bishop of Gladden, in the time before the singers of songs had claimed the land. Hanth told Vanton that the singers of songs had overrun the convent at the end of spring. All twenty of the sisters there had been slaughtered. Since then, she had been on her own. Her goal was to cross the Drogma Mountains, beyond which some believed there was safety. But Vanton assured her that if she did not make it over that forbidding range by the time the snows arrived there, she would certainly freeze in them. Perhaps she might take shelter for the winter in the old abandoned logging camp at their foot. But more likely, she was simply too late. The girl and I prayed together well into the night, but her words sounded so very empty, like a wind-up doll made to speak them. Her soul was not given over to them. Her plan is not sane. How sad it makes me that she should cling to this life so when such glory awaits us in the kingdom of heaven. From the diary of Sidroa Vanton. The old man told me about how his wife renounced the creator before she died. He found her after the singers of songs had come. They'd taken all of her. They took her eyes. They took her hands. He said it comforted him to know he would soon go exactly the same way that she did. That he will share that with her. From the Diary of Hanth. He had been waiting in this cabin, he said, not moving, for almost nine days. And so the singers almost certainly had his scent by now and would be coming for him. After praying together one last time, Hanth left him the very next morning, still heavily favoring her left leg, still sick in her lungs, still hungry for any scrap. Venton told her he did not fear death. Thank you, Creator, for everything, he wrote. Thank you for this unexpected shelter. 
thank you for the bird that came to my window. He gave Hans a handful of nuts to take with her, and then she trudged onward, toward the west through the newly fallen snow, close to death, but refusing to surrender to it. She asked me whether her path would take her towards the captive's river. I told her there was another source of water, and that was not the greatest of her concerns, but she asked me again. I wonder what business she has there. It was a 34-mile walk to the valley at the base of the Drogma Mountains. The terrain was filled with densely huddled trees and blind ridges, challenging rises and slow curving descents. Hanth walked the ghostly remains of the only road that had ever been built in the region, and she lost her way several times. She tried to think of nothing, not her past, not the future, not the creator. Some of her toes had become discolored and painful, and she had developed a deep, ripping cough. Her thin coat had never been meant for exposure to the harsh lands beyond the convent. She walked each day until she could go no further, and then collapsed under trees and tried to write in a tattered diary with pages held together with two old shoelaces. On the third night, she awoke to the feel of a great black bird, half as tall as she was tearing viciously at her shoe, and she kicked it away frantically, her angry shouts echoing through the forest around her. When she came to the mountains, she beheld the task in front of her under a swirling gray sky. She had only the word of two strangers she had encountered, that Merilus was a place safe from the singers of songs. But she felt she had no choice but to press on. It was not even known to her how long her journey would have to be. For a full day she felt herself moving upwards, having to rest much more often than normal. At times it took her two hours to slog a single mile, using a branch as a cane. Always there was the knowledge that winter was coming fast, and with it, no more chance of going forward. I came awake last night because the earth seemed to be moving all around me. I looked down from atop the rock on which I'd lain and saw below the figures of wolves rushing past in a pack. Then I heard an animal being overtaken and torn down, crying in pain. It would have been me if I had not been on higher ground. Hanth ate the nuts that had been given her, but felt herself weakening fast. Sometimes the air was so cold that eating snow for its moisture became difficult and painful on her shriveled tongue. Once she was simply knocked over by the wind, and when she rose, she realized she had passed out for the better part of an hour. Her final choice was made for her. The snows came early to the Drogma Mountains. When the first inch had fallen around her, Hanth turned and began to follow her footprints back the way she had come in a panic. Soon those prints had disappeared under the new powder. When she was too exhausted to move forward a single step, she slept with the snow collecting on her prone body and had to free her legs from it when she awoke. By the time she detoured to the south and came across the old logging camp Vanton had spoken of, she was crawling on her hands and knees, which only made the torture on her fingers more intense. The snow had mercifully stopped. Another few inches of it and she would have been immobilized. She made her way into a tiny shack among a loose ring of them and fell into a deep sleep. Outside, another foot and a half of snow would fall just twelve hours after she got to safety, beginning a cycle of storms that would pin her down for the winter. It has been thirty-five nights since I came to this camp. 
The lake is so deeply frozen over now that it takes a whole day to chip away enough to reach water. The birds provide enough game, and I have enough matches still so that I can eat every three days. I stole the matches from the convent. We were preparing to move. We'd heard what the singers of songs do before they make their true sound. There was a plan. Mother Dwayi had a map. But then she became very quiet and gave us all tea. One by one, the sisters began to fall asleep. I never drank mine. I watched her as she drank too. They were all asleep when I went into the woods. I took what I believe I had to. The shack Hant lived in had nothing more than a cot and stove. There were seven such shacks in the clearing. On some days the snow was so deep that she wasn't able to see the other ones at all. Afraid to keep the few birds and squirrels she was able to trap and kill inside the shack for fear of the starving grappler bears which roamed the forest, she tried to keep the food tied to nearby trees. But on more than one night, she heard the wet grunting sound that meant the food would be gone when she next awoke. She wrote in her diary that one of the fingers on her left hand seemed to be dead from the cold, and she had terrible, incapacitating headaches. There was nothing she could do but wait for spring, saving matches only to cook her food, no matter how brutal the winter became. In all that time, she wrote, the sun broke through the clouds only once. And on that day, she saw something just outside the camp that she never could have expected. A man was lying against a tree, new snow covering his legs. He was staring blankly into space and seemed unaware of Hanf as she approached. While he himself did not seem wounded, his clothing was covered in blood. Hanth crouched beside him and stayed with him until he seemed to regain awareness. Little by little he came to, and she was able to help him to his feet. Over the course of an hour, she got him into one of the unused shacks. By nightfall, the man was speaking and coherent. His name was Father Corvus Junian. He was a stocky man born with only one ear. He recognized Hanth immediately, having come to the Green Convent twice to bring potatoes to the sisters back before the time of the Singers of Songs. He had come from the west ridge of Spruce Nye, 15 miles away. He had been among a group of 10 men who had split into two camps on each of the area's two highest ridges, keeping watch for weeks. One night, the other camp's agreed-upon fire signal had never appeared. Junian's men had been too frightened to even go to them. The singers came for them soon after. He told Hant that if he looked at the blood stains on his clothing, he could remember exactly whose blood was whose. Junian was a severe man, distant and distracted. He became angry with Hant when she informed him that she had not moved from the camp for so long. By doing so, he said, she had all but assured the singers would soon come. Only the snow had likely slowed them. He produced a withered map from his coat and spread it out on the dirt floor beneath their feet. Hanth crouched down, and Junian explained her situation to her, drawing lines in pencil. He had come south from tree fishermen there had escaped through the valley to the east when they'd heard the singing, leaving a single note on a tree as a guide for anyone who might come later. No one had ever heard from them again. Two weeks before, the only reachable village in the southwest had been taken by the singers, every man, woman, and child killed. The Drogma Mountains to the west were now blocked off. Merilus could not be reached. In essence, they were now encircled. 
I told him that if there were a four-day period between the snows, we could attempt another climb. He said there would be no food and no water through the pass, that this camp was the only place a human being could survive. But now that he is here, the scent is that much stronger to them. I have only four more matches. He said it would take us seven days to cross the mountains at a killing pace. He told me if I died before him, he would eat me to survive. He said I needed to understand that. I returned to my shack late at night. This girl is strange. She seems unafraid of what may happen in the mountains. She does not pray, neither do I. They should have come for her and killed her by now. Makes no sense. We have an understanding that we'll begin to walk the moment this new storm passes. In the shack across the camp from hers, I removed my clothes for the first time in a long, long time. Two bloody teeth fell from my cuff where they must have lodged during the attack of the camp. I threw them out into the snow. It's risen almost to my waist. These might be my final words. They began to walk at dawn, struggling at first even to reach the trail that Hant had already followed. Father Junian carried a steel blade, and Hanth possessed a short-handled chopping axe she'd found in one of the shacks at the camp. These were their only means of self-defense, and they meant nothing against the elements. For a full day, they made slow progress into the mountains. They never spoke. When night fell, they built a fire and stared into it rather than speak. Sleep came very late, as tending to the flames required constant effort in the wind. After two or three hours of fitful rest, they were off again. In the gray light of early morning, they stopped to watch a gathering of cave vultures flying overhead. Hanth saw that two of them were carrying prey off to the north. The vultures, capable of carrying ten times their own weight, held something more valuable than owls or foxes in their long talons. One struggled to carry its burden. It was the upper torso and head of a child, the other half of the body missing. There was no way of telling from which direction the vultures had truly come or when an attack had conveniently left them with such an easy reward. The journey seemed to become doomed on the second day. The winds had risen, blowing the snow cover through the trees with such intensity that sometimes neither Hanth nor Junian could see more than two feet in front of them. A long hill rose before them, one so gradual and so steep that it took more than an hour to move a quarter of a mile. Even five consecutive steps left Hanth gasping for breath and having to rest. Waves of faintness washed over her constantly. They had measured out their food with great care and refused to deviate from those rations. When the whipping snow began to come at Junian at an almost horizontal angle because of the wind, he closed his eyes and tried to advance that way. At one point he was obstructed by a fallen tree. In climbing over it, he slipped and slammed his chin on the frozen wood. His leg became caught in a dead vine, and he twisted his ankle so badly they were forced to stop where they were for three hours. Junian coughed in sickly fits and spoke at length to someone who was not there. When his delirium passed, he made no excuse for it. Though circumstances dictated, they huddled together for warmth that night in the face of the gale sweeping over the mountains. They instead kept away from each other. Father Junian made sure of it. There was something about Hanth he had come to fear. Some look in her eyes that made her seem far older than her nineteen years. Capable of a strength that didn't seem to come from her small, broken body. 
Her curious determination scared him. He felt she was hiding some secret he didn't want to know. At dawn of the third day, after only twenty minutes of walking, the two of them came to a clearing. There they found the most awful sight. Seven women, whose manner of dress under their insufficient coats told them they were of the Sisterhood of Pliensi Monastery, lay dead in the snow. Animals had been at them, not just once, but many times, but had not taken away as much as they could have almost as if they had attempted to offer a primitive kind of respect for their piety. Sometime since Hant had first come through, the sisters had frozen to death, making their way through the mountains. In their last extremity, they had tried to commit an act of charity for those who might come after them. They had seemingly agreed to lay down end to end, forming a rough line, each stretching out a single arm that pointed toward a path through the woods that would have perhaps been missed by someone less careful than Hen. As it was, their gesture was wasted on her. Junian looked in her eyes and saw neither revulsion nor pity, only the desire to move on. But they would not move on. Cresting a hill they could see far into the distance, The sky they beheld was a terrifying one, painted thickly with gray thunderheads that stretched across the horizon as if an entire roiling ocean were hovering above the earth. That night, or more likely the next one, there would be a great and terrible snowfall. There was little hesitation in their decision to turn back. Death seemed an absolute certainty if they proceeded. There had been too many omens, both real and imagined. And so they made their way back in each other's footprints, not speaking of their despair. They knew they would have to endure the blizzard, that their pace could not possibly outrun it. But they hoped their luck would carry them just enough to a point where Hanth had identified a rock formation, which might act as a natural cave. They made it. That was where they spent hours waiting for the snow to come. When it did, a new fear gripped them, that they would be buried alive in the cave by the growing drifts. They spent hours clawing the snow away with their bare hands while desperately trying to keep their small fire alive. I cannot write any more of that night. I cannot write of how we made it back to camp. Remember it only in pieces that do not combine to make any sort of sense. Some of it is gone entirely. But I remember the moment before we began our descent. Looking back at the sisters lying dead in the snow, I I know that I saw that one of them had moved, turned over, still alive. I cared for that fact no more than I cared for that my fingernails have grown long. We walked on. The girl was either unaware or past empathy, like me. I remained in this shack for three days when the snow piled up. The girl did the same in hers. I would not call what I did sleep. It was... More like a fever dream, my body felt made of spun glass. I ate the last of my food. It happened again that I could not leave after the snow stopped, for it had risen above my head. When I was finally able to get out, I took the girl's pack and crossed the camp to her shack. During the storm, we had switched our packs without knowing. So far beyond reason we had become. Hanth was still alive, though hunger had sunk in her eyes so that Father Junian wrote she looked no different than the dead and mauled sisters out there on the mountain. Hanth asked him what would happen if they were to walk directly east, avoiding November Pass. 
The course she described traversed the Goathead Gorge, where it was said one could not see through the constant mist ten steps ahead. Not even grass grew there for two hundred miles. She asked again where the Captus River began, and I asked her what business she had there. That was when he told me to stay away from him, to not come near him ever again. He had gone through my sack. He knew why it was that the singers had not yet overtaken us. He found the Inismata. I confessed that I had discovered it in the crypts beneath the convent. He called me accursed, damned forever, and then he left. None can have mercy on that foul thing soul now. She carries the Inismata to even look into her eyes would mean something worse than death. They existed for a time across the camp from one another, in a state of living death. It would still be four more weeks before the thaw came. As soon as it was humanly possible, Hanth left her shack and trudged her way to the lake a mile away. There she spent a full day probing the ice for signs of fish and crouching beside a tree in silence, waiting for any sort of animal to appear in the hope of tracking it, striking it with her short axe or even a stone, lunging for it. Most often, these missions resulted in her returning to the camp empty-handed, exhausted even more so than usual from the mental effort it took to maintain her awareness of the forest's sounds and signs. On this day, she was able to kill a single skull bird. Into her pack with the cloth-wrapped Inismata it went, and before the light began to fade from the sky, she made her way back. Before she parted the trees and entered camp, she stopped in her tracks at a ghastly sight which, in her condition, had taken far too long to fully materialize. The snow around Father Junian's shack was streaked with red for a dozen yards in almost every direction. After Hanth had gone on the hunt, he had at some point emerged from the shack, perhaps to find food of his own. His diary made no mention of his intentions. A giant grappler bear stood near his door now, head low, its jaws working to eat the remains of its kill. Junian's body had been torn into pieces. Hanth could see his head and torso several feet away, while the bear chewed on one of his severed legs, which it had dragged several yards away into a clearer patch of snow. Junian's death must have been violent and agonizing. It was not the first time a grappler had approached the camp, but now one had finally attacked, driven most likely by its own desperate hunger. When the bear rose from the snow and began to turn, Hanth instinctively collapsed into a small drift beside a tree to stay unseen. She tried to control her breathing and move not an inch. She heard the bear snort and moan forty yards away. Afraid to shift or turn her head, she could only wait for it to go away. For a half hour, the light faded from the sky above her. The wind blew snow off high branches down onto her face, and she could only blink it away. When the sky had taken on the deep blue tinge of twilight, she became aware of a sharp smell nearby, and she heard the bear grunt. It had never left the area, and it had now ventured beyond the camp into the trees. I imagined I could smell the blood on its mouth. This is what blood smells like, I thought, and thought it over and over and over again. I heard its footsteps getting closer. It would stop, 
and I could hear it panting as it tried to understand where the human scent was coming from. Hanth decided that at the sound of the bear's very next step, she would close her eyes for good and feign death, her only defense. But that step never seemed to come. It was full dark when she dared lift her head over the snow and peer through the gloom. The grappler was lying on its side, just twenty feet away from her. It was dead. She knew at once that the power she'd acquired via the Inismata had protected her. She made her way toward her shack, averting her eyes from Junian's remains. She was not even at her door when over the wind the sound came which had been weeks in arriving. So far in the distance that it wasn't even possible to tell from which direction it came, there emerged a rhythmic clapping, constant, never getting nearer or farther away, seeming to defy the acoustics of the forest. She put her hands to her ears, shutting it out. All her choices had finally been made for her. The time had come for one last effort at escape to another place. She put whatever she could into her sack and crossed the camp. She could not proceed without Father Junian's map, and so she had to move directly through the spot where he had been slaughtered, trying to keep her eyes on the rising moon. The clapping sound was ceaseless. She was finally able to determine that it was coming from the north and west. She spent a few minutes studying the map and going through Junian's possessions in search of food or any sort of weapon. Yet he had neither. His steel blade was inexplicably gone. She put snow into her mouth to gain whatever moisture she could from it, and then she left, headed directly east, needing rest badly but unable to even entertain the notion. She would push herself until she broke. As she knew they would, the sounds that the singers created remained a constant throughout the night. They knew not to come too close, not yet, not until their feeding was assured. Because of what she carried, Hanth was indeed a different sort of prey now. Her legs carried her forward on until dawn, when she lost consciousness. The clapping brought her back to it with a new sky overhead. She consulted the map again and again, knowing that whoever had drawn it, working with only primitive knowledge, had of course misrepresented the terrain. What lay off the November Pass was an unknown, but even an inaccurate map assured her that hers was the swiftest course to the Captus River. She came across it almost by accident. Deep and dangerous, it had never frozen over. There was no crossing it, but that had never been Hanth's intention. The moment she reached a hand out to break its bone-chilling surface, something happened. The clapping sounds stopped. The woods became utterly silent again, without echo. She knew the singers had not retreated, but were only waiting, sensing from afar. In that moment, she knew that Father Junian had been right about her. She was accursed. She removed the Inismata from her pack, unwrapped the strands of cloth which she had sacrificed from the layer around her fingers, and immersed it in the waters of the Captus River where in the year of the Titan, four centuries before, 
Two frenzied armies had crossed a sheet of ice to attack each other, with a bloodlust so intense it was written that no man had survived, filling the river with thousands of corpses. She set the Inismata aside, waited several minutes, and then plunged her entire arm into the river, feeling as if her heart might suddenly stop. When the frigid pain had reached a level of intensity that threatened to black her out, she just barely felt an unseen object make contact with her open palm. With great effort, she was able to clasp the thing tightly and pull her numb arm out again. In her hand, she now held a different one, severed at the wrist, so old it had become blackened and mummified, two fingers gone. This object, too, she placed into her pack and then her run from the now silent singers continued. Hanth made her way along the banks of the cactus and rejoined the trail that had originally taken her toward the logging camp. Her journey ended with the sight of a now familiar dark cabin. My body has become unrecognizable to me. It has long been eating itself, but still, somehow, I function. The old man, Banton, hung himself some time ago. It is so cold inside the cabin that his body was perfectly preserved. He did not wait for death to come to him. He went to it. I cut him down and put him out in the snow and sat down to write in this diary. A quarter of an hour ago, the clapping began again, much closer now. It is midday. The sky is gray and terrible. There will be another storm. For all I know, it waited because of me. That is the power I possess in the sack at my feet. One more hour at most, and it will be time to use it. The clapping sounds came again, for the last time. So close that Hant knew the singers of songs were just beyond the tree line behind the cabin. She removed the chopping axe from her pack and propped herself against a wall, sitting on the cold dirt floor. She grasped the inismata in her left hand, and using strips of rags torn from the shirt of the dead man lying outside in the snow, she bound her hand around it tightly. It is not known whether the singers appeared to her before or after she raised the axe high over her head and brought it down again and again onto her left wrist. They came forward through the trees all around the cabin, finally emboldened enough to come for the strange woman who emanated a power they did not understand. If there was fear among them, no one would ever know. It was only when Hanth saw them that they would have begun to sing in the manner that had driven even soldiers insane. But upon coming across the scene later, pikesmen from Okinawa swore they found no dead wildlife in the area. So it is likely they never truly did sing. Perhaps the rhythmic clapping of their hands was their only message. When Hanth emerged from the cabin, leaving a spatter of blood behind her that stretched all the way to the door. The left hand she had been born with nineteen years before was gone, but in its place was a mummified male hand twice as large as her own had been. It had become one with her body, sometime in the lost moments when she had become unconscious. The priests of November write 
of what she was certainly forced to endure at its will in those moments. Where the hand explored, unwelcome and savage. The singers came in uncertain rows and columns, their tiny bare feet struggling through the snow. The largest of them was perhaps three feet tall. Theirs were the arms, feet, hands, heads of children. They possessed no eyes, no ears. Small, toothless mouths could form no words, only a discordant music. Their fingers were long enough to surround a grown man's neck and tapered at their ends. They took no food from the woods around them, needed no rest. When the closest of them came near enough, Hanth raised her left arm to the sky. The black and white snowscape was suddenly lit by orange and yellow bursts of flame. Several of the dozens upon dozens of singers spontaneously caught fire. Then more of them, each engulfed with a sound like a tree branch thudding into the deep snow beneath it. And then a strangely animal-like cry of dismay. Fire ate them whole, and yet in perishing they clapped on, slamming their palms together, fingernails like thorns connecting with each other. Hint's arm remained aloft, stretching upwards. Within seconds, all of the singers had caught fire. They stopped marching forward only when the flames ate through their legs. Little by little, the clapping died out. All around Hanth, the forest was alight with fire. She smelled burning flesh and roasting blood. I have returned to the cabin. They are all gone. The hand has protected me. For how long, I do not know. It itches. It wants more. Outside, their bodies are black. The snow is black. I see bones and fingers and heads burned away only partly. Night is coming. Hanth's diary ends there. Her fate was pieced together from what others found inside and outside the cabin in the spring, as well as the words describing the power of the Inismata, which were etched on a scroll in the crypts beneath the green convent, a scroll Hanth may never have seen. The story told itself very clearly. Perhaps the very moment after Hanth had retreated to safety and written her last words, she felt a sudden and all-devouring heat erupt in her lower legs. She would have had perhaps two seconds to understand what was happening to her. She would have had time to think about nothing but the pain before her legs caught fire inside the cabin. It would have been impossible not to scream. From her legs, the fire spread upward at unnatural speed. Her arms and head were last to be swallowed by flame. She ran forward and threw herself head first into the glass of the cabin's only window in a blind attempt to reach the snow outside. But her fate was set. What remained of her in the thaw was nothing more than a collection of lonely bones found under the collapsed, charred remains of the cabin. They were wordlessly buried in the shade of a mist-soaked ridge three miles to the east. I have had dreams in which we are people of the distant past, spoken of in pity for what we endured. In others, this is all happening centuries in the future. When I awake, I'm not sure which I should believe. I only want to sleep again, and none of this is real. Oh, sleep. Please come before the night does.